Yeah, audio works. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I'm not getting any connection. Ben, your dad's calling your names. How is he? How about not? It's okay, we call names all the time. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you can see it in, in the apartment. It's just like we just sit around and all we do is just call, call you names, sir. But, but it's just a favorite pastime. That's how we get work done. Call it names, sir? Yeah, names, sir. Yeah, names, sir. Names, sir. Again, uh, we have pizza available over there, as well as courtesy of the uh, ACMW, which is our new women in computing organization. We also have desserts and treats. Uh, not alcoholic drinks, but <laughs> slightly more disappointing drinks. Oh. <laughs> no, they're great. Thank you. Thank you, Kara Brun, for bringing those. Um, but please feel free to go grab some. We have lots of pizza. We have lots of desserts. We have lots of soda. Um, so please feel free to grab some. Hello, hello. Glad you guys can make it. Uh, we have a couple more minutes, so feel free to hang out. Talk amongst yourselves. I know you're bad at it because you're a CS major, but you know, practice socializing a little bit. Optimism, Colton. Optimism. Okay, so are we watching a sitcom? Yeah. 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 Oh, we ignore that all, all the time. It's not like there's actually any computers in here besides the ones that we brought in. Would you freak the freak out? Mr. Shulay? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Hello. Hello. Yes, do you have a question? Uh, the internet's broken? Uh, for Linux machines, yeah. I said, are you sure it's not just the internet all over the world? We were having Because that could be it. I mean, that could happen. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen that IT crowd scene? What? We're having issues on here. Oh my gosh, I'm introducing you to the IT crowd. You are Have you not connected on Linux before, though? Yeah, I have. It's just like here. It's only here. Then try moving two seats over. I don't know, but it's probably some parts of Maybe by next week. I'm not allowed to move on. And I've been shut to in my room for a while now. Yeah, how's it hanging? Glad to hear it. Have you met our guest yet? Yes, this is Hannah Penny with our treasurer. Hannah, this is Lisa Morris. This is Dr. Ken Myers. I'm going to keep you with the doctor. <laughs> Dr. Tripper's name, right? Yeah. I mean, I guess that's from. 
Yeah, right. Leave some water. Hello, how are you? Uh, we, we can get some more chairs. You got a cool. Alright. Alright guys, we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, welcome. This is the Association for Computing Machinery. If this is your first time joining us, we're glad to have you. Uh, if you don't know what we are, we are the Computer Science Professional Development Organization. So if you like computer science, professionality, and development, or any mixture of those things, you're in the right place. Uh, for today's meeting, we have Raytheon speaking to us about um, software engineering in the defense industry. But first, we have a few announcements. <laughs> we have t-shirts, or we're getting t-shirts, rather. Uh, Hannah, do you want to talk to us about that? Yeah, with fall, I forgot that our end of order date was fall break, so we're going to extend it a little longer, just so people still have time to order. Um, they are $15 if you pre-order, or if you wait until after. They are $18, but supplies will be limited, so if you want one, go ahead and order now. And you can either shoot me a text on the group meet, or you can come talk to me after if you want one. All right, yeah, uh, please, please talk to Hannah if you have questions about that. Um, yeah, the next thing we have uh, is this weekend. Uh, it's something we're quite excited about. Andrew. Yeah, so the Game Jam is going to be this weekend, uh, 12 p.m. on Saturday to 12 p.m. on Sunday. Uh, if you're not familiar with what a Game Jam is, you basically have 24 hours to make a game. Uh, it doesn't, don't feel like, um, you know, your, your skill level isn't quite there cause there's, or anything like that. Cause there's going to be people that will help you. It's just going to be a fun time, so you should just come, try to make whatever you can. Uh, there will be snacks and, like, coffee and stuff provided. But 12 p.m. on uh, Saturday to 12 p.m. on Sunday into 06 West. All right. Um, the, so we're, we're going to go ahead and, uh, oh, one more announcement. Uh, next week's meeting, uh, 5.30 here, we're going to be talking about the history of computing. That's something we're excited about as well, so you guys should be there. Uh, Ethan's the one you should talk to. Ethan, there we go. Um, uh, all right, we're going to go ahead and get started. It is my pleasure to introduce our two guests for tonight. Uh, we have... Two senior principal systems engineers here. You can tell I've been thinking about how to introduce them for a while. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Kenneth Duane Myers. <laughs> we lovingly, affectionately call him Dad. Um, and then we also have Lisa Morris. So um, this is actually going to be a like two hour or so presentation. The first is going to be in the space of the traditional ACM meeting, uh, and it's going to be about this stuff, software engineering in the defense industry. But then also after that, we have the, the one hour presentation from Lisa, one hour or so, I guess, I don't know. Uh, but presentation in the space after this um, about uh, women in the defense industry, right? Uh, so that'll be for the ACMW, which is our new women in computing organization. That's something we're also really excited about. Uh, and even if you are not a woman in computing, you're just in computing in general, uh, we do invite you to attend. It's, it's great conversations, very important stuff. So we are happy to have these guests. Please, round of applause to welcome Raytheon. Okay, next slide. Oh, already? So I'm Ken Myers. Um, I'm not a computer science major. I was actually a physicist in uh, undergrad, graduate school, but my first job was as a software engineer. <coughs> Worked as a software engineer for Raytheon from 99 through about 2006. Uh, from there, I moved on to systems engineering, and I've been in systems engineering ever since. Um, Tonight, today I want to talk a little bit about what software engineering is like and what some of the opportunities in the defense industry are, and then talk a little bit about career op opportunities and the career opportunity that I took, which was to move from software into systems engineering. Who here has heard of systems engineers? Okay, not many, okay? So if it's one route you can take if you want to stay and write code for, until you retire. 
and move up through the company, that is also a definite opportunity. So there's lots of possibilities out there. Key things is I'm here for you guys. <clears throat> you people. I use guys as a gender neutral term for me. If I say guys, I'm, um, I'm here for you today, okay? If you have questions, if you have questions about what it's like to work for a defense contractor, to work as a software engineer, work as a systems engineer, live in Dallas, be his dad, let me know. <laughs> uh, that's, what, that's why I'm here, okay? So please don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, there's lots of things that we can talk about. So um, for me, I started off in, uh, as a physics major. I like to solve hard problems. To me, it's all about solving hard problems. The method you use, the mechanism you use to solve those problems is very much secondary. There's lots of different ways to solve hard problems, right? You can write code. You can deal with people. <laughs> you can manage the people. You can do measurements. You can take more data. You can look stuff up in books. You can do more research. There's lots of, you think creatively, think outside the box. There's all sorts of things that you can do to solve hard problems. And that's what's always motivated me. <clears throat> that's why I do the job that I do. I like to solve hard problems. So moving from a physics degree to a software engineer was not that difficult of a transition for me. Um, yeah, okay, I had to learn how to code, which turns out to be kind of important as a software engineer, okay? But I hate to break it to you, it's not the most important thing, okay? I do believe that anybody can learn how to write code, okay? That's not what being an effective software engineer is all about. Being an effective software engineer, computer programmer, is about solving the problems, okay? If you're a software engineer, computer programmer, you tend to focus on code as the best, as the way you solve it, okay? So it's all about solving those hard problems. Um, and as a software engineer, you know, I started in 99. In a couple of years, I became a team lead uh, where I had some people working for me and I got to coordinate their activities. And then in 2006, I moved over to systems engineering, where now the problems I was solving was kind of bigger than just a piece of code that was put in front of me. It was how is the code now working with the rest of the system? Okay, and I've been working, uh, I moved over, I started off in Intelligence and Information Systems, IIS, they kind of do all this fun, spooky stuff. Uh, now I'm in Space and Airborne Systems, and we build things, guess what, Space and Airborne Systems. I am a lead integrator on a radar system. Anybody here like speed military stuff? Anybody here heard of JSTARS? Okay, it's the Joint Surveillance and Tactical Airborne Radar System. It is a radar that sits on the bot or hangs on the bottom of an airplane, like a big commercial 707 <coughs> style airplane. Looks off on the side and two, 300 miles away can detect things moving on the ground. That's what I'm working on right now. Okay, so that's an idea of some of the things that Space and Airborne System uh, does. Next slide, please. Okay, so why work in defense? We'll make this one audience interaction. Why work in the defense industry? Job security. Jobs. Man, I wish that were always true. <laughs> the truth is programs come up and they ramp up a bunch of people. And then you finish the job and then the, the ramp down. And then something else comes up and ramps down. And you always have about two years, maybe one year, it feels like a job security. But you never really quite feel like you have a job until you retire. But I don't think that's any different than any other industry. I think most industries have that. Um, at least now, yes, it's so not like what they come back. So yeah, most industries are cyclical. It's just a matter of how long the cycles are. And so defense in general has a tendency to have a longer period of being up than down. And the peak of the wave is typically as an industry not real high. It doesn't usually go way high and then way down, like some of the things on the in the commercial sector. It's usually a much flatter wave, and so that's why it's got the reputation of being more stable and more secure, but they all have a <clears throat> Along those lines, I say programs come and go, 
Okay, so you, you build a program, you release it, it's done for production, and then you find the next program. What you find yourself doing is you're looking for the next job. We have a management group, it's called functional management, which Lisa does, which one of her jobs is to make sure that we're putting the right engineers on the right programs. So yeah, in general, job security, we, we're pretty good. What else? What else would we do? Jobs in this defense. Security clearances are pulled. Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. Yes, they are. And for all of you that are wondering, how do you get a security clearance? Keep your nose clean. Stay out of trouble. Be honest. Keep uh, good records of everybody you pretty much have ever known. Um, yes, stay out of trouble. Uh, don't do drugs. Um, variety of things. Uh, it's really not that hard, the background check. Okay, what else? Yes, sir. So I, I think like the uh, defense is the place where innovation is going to happen. It's one of the places that, uh, you know, the country is going to really invest a lot of money, federal uh, money is going to come in. Uh, it's also the case, it's an incubator of the technologies of tomorrow. Because uh, at, uh, if, you're, if you're defending the nation, you have to stay ahead of whatever the rest of the people can come up with and do. Absolutely. The, if you want cutting edge technology, <coughs> Cutting edge, it's, and it's kind of different. If you want cutting edge, real technology out ahead of what everybody else is doing, that's what we're doing all the time. The, the things that we build to keep it, to meet the schedule and the cost and the performance constraints needed have to be the newest, most cutting edge stuff. Absolutely. What else? Benefit? I'm sorry, what? Benefit. Benefits? Uh, actually, yeah, big corporate uh, company, you know, decent decent benefits, cannot complain about that. Um, for me personally, I like the idea of uh, going to work every day knowing that I help keep our country safe. Okay, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a military nut. I don't really do the whole weapon systems and things like this, but it does make it easier to know that when I go into work, I'm, the work I'm doing does help keep our country safe. That is, definitely motivates me. Why else? Any other ideas? Okay. Well, I think my answer simply is when you're learning doing something software, do you like playing with something new? Or do you like doing the same thing that you've been doing? Always like doing something new, right? Bigger computers, new code, new cutting edge stuff. Most importantly, we have right, the coolest toys, okay? We have the things we build. I've flown on the aircraft. I Well, I haven't flown. I've been on the aircraft. I've seen some of the systems we build. We build really cool <coughs> stuff. I'm not building, writing software to keep track of money at a bank. I, oh, I know. Ouch. <laughs> I didn't say insurance company. I said bank. We do banking. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm not doing keep it, writing code to keep track of an HR department personnel records. We build things. <laughs> what? Attacking everybody. <laughs> <laughs> was their last guest speaker. So, <laughs> so you want to go up to Cisco next? <laughs> we don't build software that goes on internet switches. Actually, we do. <laughs> um, but we build absolutely some of the coolest toys. Next one. Let's see. What are the type of toys? Uh, Completely revamping how we're doing um, the surveillance of the airspace in the United States. With all the different radio stuff that's happening, all the wireless connections, all the LTE, 3G, radar, car, radar, avoidance, collision, detection, all of that type of stuff, the electromagnetic spectrum is very, very full. Okay? It needs to be revamped. What else? Uh, battle management. So, if you want to pull in data across zillions of different places, try to display it in a, in a format that people can actually make decisions based on, big data type stuff, where you have a really tight decision loop 
where you have to make a decision based upon the most recent information as quickly as possible. How do you analyze that data? How do you portray it? How do you enable the person to make the decisions in real time? Next. Okay, this is my favorite. I just saw it. It's a laser dune buggy. <laughs> That's like out of a video game from 1998. I mean, that is just, just uh, too cool. What? I was, immediately when I saw it, I was like, yeah, it looks like something from Halo, honestly. I know, exactly. It looks like something out of Halo. It is a laser dune buggy to take down UAVs. Okay. Now think about all the problems, everything that has to go into trying to take out a UAV. Do we have a person with a joystick looking on a monitor trying to find the UAV, you know, moving the crosshairs? Or is there a radar system trying to detect it or an optical system? How do you point it? How do you figure out where the UAV is going? Uh-oh, it hid behind a tree and we lost it. Oh, there it is back. I don't know. I don't know the details on this system, but it's a laser dune buggy. So I just thought that that was the, the coolest thing ever. Oh, by the way, you are not allowed to look at the ratio on the tweets on these. These are official Raytheon tweets. Okay, next. Uh, speaking of UAVs, I don't know if this is flown against the laser dune buggy yet, but this was a uh, UAV designed for uh, hurricane hunting. Um, so there's all sorts of different sensors in there. Um, and the next slide. Okay, so a pic from a uh, satellite built and flown by Raytheon of the Eclipse. And you can see the dark shadow from that. And think about everything that has to go into making a satellite as far as the software to command and control to collect the data, process the data, downlink the data, get it home, disseminate the data, label the data, metadata, put it in, in libraries, all of that type of stuff. All sorts of really cool stuff. Um, what next one is, I think, my favorite. Nope. Okay, so we have the first responder EKV, the exoatmospheric kill vehicle uh, for missile defense. So the idea is that that thing is supposed to hit an incoming missile really, really fast in the start of <laughs> Okay, this hopefully does not have applications in the real world. Okay, next. This is my project. It's fun when the corporate Raytheon actually tweets out the project I'm working on. Uh, it's a bit of a new thing for me. I've always worked in, in cases where we don't talk too much about what we're doing. Um, this is Archimedes. Uh, this is the JSTARS replacement radar. This is the project I'm working on. And the idea that each one of these little dots you see is a little tiny antenna. Okay, and you have all these little tiny antennas, and they all have to work in unison to act like one big antenna. Remember constructive destructive interference waves? Okay, so all the phases all have to be perfectly aligned. You steer the antenna by adding little phase shifts to it, do all sorts of things, and then you have to process all that data on the airplane and then present it to a um, uh, analyst on the plane so they can make decisions. This is what I'm building right now. Um, trying to get it to work in the lab. Questions so far? Cool toys? Cool toys? Good. Okay. So, a little bit of software. So what type of software do we have? Real-time embedded is something that you probably don't get a lot of experience in. Uh, maybe if you're doing some of the robotics, you may. A lot of the work we do, real-time computing. There's a clock going off in the system, and you have to do the next two milliseconds worth of processing in the next two millisecond clock window or whatever frequency that clock is running at, probably higher. Um, so you have to keep up, you have to work in real time. Think about all those things, all the uh, missiles, cars, lasers, radars, <coughs> anything that needs real time control. You're going to be running a real time embedded uh, processor. That's defense in the in commercial world Automotive industry has real-time embedded computing. Every car has the computers which control the oxygen air intake and the fuel and all and give you that little engine light if there's a problem and you have no idea because you don't have the source code to your car's computer, right? So uh, real-time embedded is huge. Big data. We talked a little bit about, you know, taking some of the satellite imagery or taking the command and control stuff, putting it together to give to somebody so that they can make a decision. It's one thing when that decision is a business saying, how do I invest my resources to make more money in the future? Okay, how do I target my political campaign to reach my audience and get more votes? 
it's a completely other thing when you try to do the big data and figure out how do I do all this data so that my ship can respond to a threat adequately, accurately, quickly. Okay, how do I determine what is real versus false alarms? Okay, what is the penalty for dealing, for having a false alarm? Okay, it's a little bit different in, in this world. So the threshold is a little bit higher on a lot of our software. We have lives at stake. Okay, so the big data with lives at stake, fun, hard problems. Uh, the geospatial stuff, this is a favorite of mine. Um, Kind of from uh, my, my previous uh, life um, in IIS, but the idea of how do you take all this data that's collected from all, all around the world, pictures of the earth in various places, information about elevation, information about where things are moving, information about where things were, where buildings are, what's the layout of buildings, where people are, where people live, all of that type of stuff, put it together into something that is, is usable. And then store it in a library so that now somebody can access it. How do you actually write an API layer to access that kind of data on the fly? Okay, lots of good software in there. Um, human interfaces, we showed some of the GUI screens where you have 16 monitors up with Windows. I don't know if that's the most effective way to manage data. So I think probably a lot of work in improving the human interface. Think about it, uh, somebody on the field, or think about a car. You're driving in your car. How do you have a better human interface? Show the speed speedometer on a on your window. Something like that on a heads-up display. How do we do heads-up displays for troops in the field so they don't know where the bad guys are and where the good guys are? Uh, robotics, okay. UAVs are huge. Wheeled robotics are, are huge. All sorts of stuff. If that's a field, something you're interested in, there's all sorts of possibilities. Um, and, and then infrastructure data centers. The world is cloud driven. The defense industry is the same way. There's a cloud system now behind a whole lot of everything we do. So if you're interested in trying to learn to deploy stuff to the cloud, there's all sorts of possibilities. And I know somebody that could probably talk a lot more in depth about that. Mr. Porter. Okay. Uh, and then finally, computer security. Raytheon has now a whole cyber emphasis area. Is it, a, is it a, what do they call it? Yeah. So we've got a business unit. Business unit, there we go. <clears throat> on cyber. So how do we keep the uh, world safer from a computer security standpoint? Questions? Okay. Next slide. Where are we at? Okay, so uh, open the doors. You know, what type of career paths can you uh, follow as, as a software engineer? Um, so obviously a software developer, uh, computer programmer, software engineer, whatever you want to call it. You can stay in writing code for your entire career. Raytheon offers a technical advancement, technical ladder for, to allow you to say technical the entire time, okay? You can write code um, if that's the thing that you like to do. Most people at some point say, I've probably written enough code and what I really want to do is I really want to make sure code is working at a higher level. I want to start coordinating other people's code. Or I want to tell them how to write their code, right? Uh, I want to start designing the interfaces. Okay, so I want to now create the, these architecture, the computer architecture. Um, so we have software architects. Uh, and that's a, a really common way that people in software advance and become a software architect. Um, information systems, we always have the IS, uh, IT departments. Um, and then you can do what I, like I did, move into systems engineering. Um, or worse yet, you can move into management. Uh, the nice thing actually is at mid-level management, I will say, allows you to stay predominantly technical. And that's kind of cool, okay? Because now what happens is as you grow in your career, you start off with, you know, you're responsible for your function. I can do this. And now you're responsible for bigger function and bigger function. At some point, you become responsible for more than you can code. So you have to now start working with other people. And now you start, you have technical responsibility for, you know, something for eight people, 10 people, 40 people, and kind of that, that transition to from being an individual per contributor to management is pretty, actually, um, it's pretty smooth. Um, anything else? Um, so, um, well, I don't. So, from a career growth perspective, 
as Ken said, yes, there is the dual technical route. But you've got the option of whether or not you want to be primarily on the technical side, which is where Ken and I live. We kind of love saying technical, but because there are people who love being on that more management side of the house <coughs> and love demonstrating their leadership skills that way, then yes, we have a parallel track that is on the managerial side. Um, and so that's where that, that management piece can kick in. So you've got options. You know, when, as, as you're going through your career. And when we kick in a little later, I'll show you how to look at and apply to some of the openings that Raytheon has. That's, that ends up being a thing that you want. So we'll, we'll do that after you the end. So the route I took is, is to move from software to systems engineering. The idea was that I want to deal with the bigger picture. Okay, For a lot of the systems that we did, I showed you pictures of, of doom buggies and planes and stuff. I didn't show you any pictures of software. Okay, the systems we, we have have lots of different parts, lots of different components. And it's kind of fun now treating software as one of those components, kind of that glue that makes everything else work. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so what, what is systems engineering? And I have broke a rule by having a slide with too many words. So we're just going to read the yellow. Uh, defines customer needs and required functionality. So we work with the customer to try to figure out what are the requirements of the system. What does it need to do? The customer typically, I hate to say it, doesn't know the answer. They have a vague idea of what they want. Has it, have you ever had that problem? Have you ever had an assignment where you don't know what the professor <laughs> wants you to do? <laughs> <laughs> Always? Okay, and your question is, I don't know what they, what to do. What do we do? I don't know. What do you normally do when you have that problem? Office hours. Office hours, you ask the? Customer. What? Customer. Ask the customer, ask the professor. What are you asking for? What do you want? Now, we try to be a little bit smarter than that, because if we've been doing our homework, we probably already have a list of technical solutions that fit well within the Raytheon business line, and any company is going to be this way. Okay, so we're going to be offering our solutions that we think is going to best meet their needs. Okay, we're maybe do a little bit of sales in that. And I've been fortunate in my current job, I've been meeting with the customer and kind of help talk about requirements a little bit. Okay, and it's an iterative process. We go round and round and round, and they change things at the last minute on us. Has that ever happened? Uh, do the professors, the CS professors, intentionally change things at the last minute on you? Yes. They do to see how well you adapt to change? Do they? Good, good, good. Real world training, that's important. Okay? Absolutely. Um, they don't give me ideas. I love it. Uh, yeah, exactly. You think you have everything figured out, and then the last minute they're like, oh, no, we want 10 times the number. How, did you, how well did your solution scale? Okay, did you hard code the sizes in, or did you make it a, a configuration file? Okay, does your architecture scale? Can you massively parallelize it to run on multiple processors, or did you hard code it to run on three? Okay, well, from a design standpoint, those things cost more money. Did you invest beforehand? Did you have the time to do it, or are you last minute trying to get this turned in and you just hard coded it because you know that's that's fast enough. Okay, so working all those requirements is is really the critical side. The other side, and I think this is honestly the more fun piece, is that system engineering integrates all the disciplines and specialty groups into a team effort, and that's the part that I find fun. So I, nobody works for me directly. I have no direct reports on an org chart. There is nobody under my name. But I right now have about 15 people dotted lined to me supporting my effort. Okay, I have electrical engineers, I have mechanical engineers, I have software engineers. Uh, right now, I have people that are primarily handling ordering stuff and logistics. Uh, setting up the lab. I mean, just all sorts of, of different people that are all supporting me. So 
I moved from software. Now I'm kind of helping direct software from a system standpoint. I'm looking at the big picture and trying to figure out what do we need the software? Okay, and I get to work with multiple disciplines. As a physicist, I find that, that to be interesting. Okay, next slide. Okay, so main thing that software engineers or systems engineers try to do is manage the complexity. When you picture the customer coming to you and saying, we want this. We want a aircraft that has a radar system that can see something 200 miles away and can manage um, 10 million contacts per second and uh, operator sees feedback instantly or within, say, a tenth of a second and they start throwing all these things on you. You're looking at this going, there's no way we can do this. What do we do? How do we handle it? Well, when you get a, a, a uh, problem that looks really hard, really complex, what do you do? What do you try to do? Break it, down. Break it down. Break it down into smaller pieces. Does it matter if it's a physics problem or a math problem or a CS problem or a history paper? No, even in the history paper, you're going to be writing, okay, what are my three points I want to make? Right? Okay, and you break it down into those three points. So, you break it down into um, smaller problems. Define the relationships between the parts. Define the interfaces, the API. Uh, define the role of each of those parts. So now you have your, your function that you've defined and you have the role of it, you have the API, the interface for that function, and you also have now written a unit test to make sure that that function works as, as expected. And then you understand the trade-offs, okay? Unlike academia, we have significant schedule constraints. Actually, we have all sorts of constraints. College students, you guys have constraints. It's 2 a.m., you have a paper due tomorrow, and your friend comes by and says, hey, want to go out? <coughs> next slide. <coughs> oh, next slide, sorry, I skipped it. I had the wrong order on that one, there we go. You have to pick the trade-offs. Fortunately, seldom do you get all three in this world. You only get two. So, sleep, social life, or good grades? What is it? Okay. In our industry, what we have is schedule, technical, and cost. Can we meet the requirements? Can we do it on schedule? And can we do it under budget? Typically, you do, we don't have the flexibility, the the budget, the time to be able to do all three. So we have to figure out <clears throat> where do we make the trade-offs? Do we have time to do this extra work that later is going to help us really do a better job and it'll be great and it's gonna make the system easier to use for the next generation, but it has to be ready in a month. What do you do? Or oh, if we only had eight more people to be able to do this, we could break it apart, we could meet our schedule but we don't have eight more people, and we can't get eight more people because they're all busy doing other things. What do you do? So we have to weigh the technical solutions often in terms of schedule and cost. And you all have done that at various times, right? Anybody get to a point late at night, you're working on a paper and say, good enough, we're done. <coughs> okay, good enough, we're done. Okay, so I will tell you, once you get into the corporate world, Good enough is good enough. If it meets the customer requirements, you're done. We like to make things better. We like to polish them and make them all nice and shiny and have an absolutely perfect thing. But sometimes good enough is good enough, and that's where we have a responsibility <coughs> to step in and say, if it meets the requirements? Okay, I'll go back one slide real quick. Okay, so best jobs in America, mine. Good. Okay. 2009. Two th oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so busted. So busted. Okay. I mean, what are we talking about? This, this is a great job. Yeah, it is a great job. Um, so the general idea, what we go through is we have the product uh, development life cycle, or you'll sometimes hear it referred to as the system engineering V. Uh, anybody see this before? Something similar to this? What class? Software Sorry. engineering. Oh. Software engineering. Um, okay. When I was looking, I had this week. 
Okay, cool, good. So I'm talking software engineering. You heard this in software engineering. We're on the same page. I like it. So the idea is that at some point the customer says, we want something that does this. Really cool thing. I need a customer. Who wants to be a customer? Okay, tell me, tell me, ConOps, what do you want to do? <clears throat> Come up with a product. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, I want this product, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> if you have the schedule, if you have the budget, we can provide whatever you want. <laughs> Our shareholders will be quite happy. Um, we want a fun of it. Pick something that would be helpful to you as a student, or that you think would just be cool. Pretty tall. Let's something we can build. A missile full of sharks. Thank you, sir. Excellent. Good. Good. We got shark missile NATO. Whatever. Yes. Okay. So a, a missile full of sharks. Very good. So can you describe what you want this missile full of sharks to do? Um, ideally everything. Okay. It's good. My homework and my laundry for me. Oh, okay. I want to do a million things. Okay. <laughs> good. So, so we have a customer con ops. They want a, a shark missile. I like this. Uh, so our job is to now work on defining the requirements. <clears throat> How big do you want? How big can you make it? <laughs> How many sharks do you want? Does it need to fit in your apartment? Probably. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. Go so, what are the, the what are the dimensions of your apartment? I've actually seen your apartment. You, yeah, you probably know more. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's a college apartment, so it'll probably fit like eight in foot, a bread box. Eight foot tall? Sure, that good. Actually, it, we can probably put it on its end, right? <laughs> okay, eight, eight foot long and say two foot wide? Sure. Okay, good. How many sharks does it need? Um, what kind of shark like something a lot of room for sharks. Yeah. Well, it depends on the size of the shark. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe sharks are adult sharks. Mini sharks. But, but it doesn't have full-grown teeth and it's ready to kill things. So okay. It's not worth it Mini full-grown sharks. Okay. So, the missile shall be no taller than two meters and shall contain a minimum of eight sharks. What word did I use there that's important? I'll go ahead and press the button. I think we can meters. Requirements. Ah, there we go. Shall. Shall. Okay. So there's a special language here that is really important in customer speak. It's called shall. And basically anything that has shall is a legal requirement that we have to follow. They may say lots of things. We want this. We want this. But if the requirements document doesn't have the word shall, it's not a requirement. It's a comment. Is that true, Lisa? Yeah. Yeah. It says we only have to do the shall. So it's kind of like... Um, when you play Simon Says, <laughs> <laughs> it's the same kind of thing. So I'm Simon and I say jump up and down. You don't have to jump up and down until I say Simon Says jump up and down. Right. And so, the same thing with our requirements. So we have two requirements. <clears throat> shall be two meters tall or less and shall contain a minimum of eight sharks. Let's see, are those both necessary? I think we demonstrated, I don't know, eight, but... There has to be a use case for that somewhere. <laughs> okay. Uh, and is it achievable? Probably. Okay. So, next one. Okay. Okay. Oh, hey, this could come in handy. The moat for uh, the sharks. Okay. So, how important is it to communicate clearly on the requirements? Uh, suddenly, a heated exchange took place between the king and the moat contractor. Okay. So, we want to make sure our requirements are clear. Which side of the building we want? Let's make sure we put the sharks on the inside of the missile, not hanging on the outside. Mm -hmm. Although then you could have deployable sharks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Okay, so high-level design. Break it down into pieces to find the interfaces with other components to determine subsystem performance. So now we need to figure out the propulsion system for the missile. So we have eight foot tall by or, sorry, I said two meter tall. Okay, two meter tall by say one meter circumference. Anybody want to figure out the volume of that real quick? And then we can multiply that by the density and come up with the mass. And then we can figure out, okay, the mass, how far do we need to launch it? So we can come up with the thrust of the engine and we could do all those types of things, right? Well, that's like almost sound like some physics stuff involved here. Cool. 
Okay, so we can determine the uh, the performance of the um, the engine and all of the little pieces, parts. And actually, I think here we probably need to determine the performance constraints of the sharks. Okay, so we need like superhuman robotic sharks with lasers That's doable. to help you cut paper. Sharks apply to win, but if we can do lasers too, then why not? Can you put a missile pack on the shark? Lasers. <laughs> that just got recursive on me. Live sharks, not robot sharks. He didn't say. <laughs> he did not, not say live sharks. He didn't say shell. <laughs> so you know, it's up to me to implement it. Okay. Next. Go down. So detailed design. Can we implement it? So this is where you're going to take all the bits and pieces, and you're going to break it up into little pieces. So all this up here, getting down to the implementation, is all the systems engineering. Take that big, ugly, complicated, hard problem, break it down into pieces that can then be implemented. Um, and then from the detailed design, we actually do the implementation. Then from the implementation, we go up and we do the subsystem test. So from a software standpoint, the subsystem test to your code would be a unit test. Right? You want to check, make sure each of the functions works correctly, and then step up, you make sure that the program as a whole works correctly. Okay, so one more. There we go. And implementation is not just software. We have hardware implementation. We have to build the hardware. We have to build the cooling, the power supplies. Um, we have some mechanical engineering. How do you mount the hardware onto your thing? And then vibration. Does it handle vibration of an aircraft in flight? Or does it handle salt fog requirements? Have you ever heard of salt fog? Anybody ever been to a beach town? You're in Oklahoma. Okay, that was probably the wrong question. <laughs> okay, you know how all metal in beach communities is rusty? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now if you're building something for the military that needs to be around salt water, it can't rust. Okay, so you have those types of requirements. I mean, you have what? Oh, yeah, 611. Okay, cool. Up. Thanks. Um, you have the human factors. How do people actually use the thing you want? In this case, how does Colton access the sharks that are inside the shark missile? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm just going to launch the missile and watch it explode and be like, wow, that was really pretty. That's really about all I thought. <laughs> okay. So I thought you wanted the, the sharks to be useful. I just thought it'd be cool to do laundry. I heard they do laundry. Okay. Shall do laundry, yes. So whenever they explode and burst everywhere, then they start doing household chores. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can flood my apartment, but I can see. And the systems are not done after they've been built. We have to support them. We have to maintain them. So now we have logistics. How do you deploy your spare parts or spare software engineers to deal with stuff? If you can't bring the system back to where it was built, then you have to have technical people. By the way, that gives you an opportunity to travel, to work remotely, to provide on-site support. There's some cool stuff there. Um, and then how do you support with the network and all that? So there's all sorts of different fields that can be part of your implementation. All of these need to be tested. So your mechanical engineering, you build a box to put your... your um, <coughs> Uh, laser from your, on your dune buggy, well, how do you test that that's strong enough? So the mechanical engineers are doing their testing. The software engineers are doing their testing. Everybody's testing their own components. And then you start integrating it. So you bring all those components together. This is yellow because this is the world that I live in right now. So I get the hardware, I get the software, I get the firmware, and I try to make the system work. What are the odds that it works right the first time? Zero. It never works right the first time um, because we either didn't define the requirements well enough or we made mistakes or our interfaces aren't correct or zillions of other reasons, right? So how do we test it? Uh, or how do we test the different interfaces, put it together, get the system to work? Um, and then at this level, we also start looking at some of the technical performance. Is the system working like we expect it should. Okay, we just have a small part of it, so maybe what I do is that that radar system system I'm building, maybe I put that into a lab. 
So in that lab, I have a couple critical components of the radar system and a scaled down antenna. And I put it in a big metal room so none of the radar energy can get out. And I actually run it and I measure the results and make sure it's working right before we put it onto a big plane. And that's the type of stuff I'm doing right now. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we go up one more. We go, oh, 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 go back, go back. Wow, I cut those. Okay, so system integration is kind of making it work. Okay. Next step up, system verification <laughs> is now working with the customer to determine to see if we actually met the requirements. Okay, so in this case with the Sharp missile, how do we verify that it met the requirements? What were the requirements? Good two. Has to be two meters tall and it um, <clears throat> has to contain no less than eight sharks. Okay, so and those are pretty easy, right? And shall do laundry. And shall do laundry. Okay, so <laughs> good. So verifying that those two requirements are pretty nice, are pretty easy, right? We get a tape measure, measure it. Okay, good. Right height, we're good. Count the sharks. One. Okay, we're good. We have all the right sharks. Um, we meet the requirements. Oh, and the shall do laundry. That one's hard to test. Okay, that was the what? That one's harder to test. That one's harder to find. Okay. And then last step, we do system validation, which is the test. Is the system actually working like the customer wants? Is it possible to meet the requirements and have something that still doesn't make the customer happy? Yeah. I think in this case, he probably had a vision for a shark missile that, did you say exploded? Okay. So he said exploded. I didn't have a requirement that the shark missile has to explode. I met all the requirements that he gave me. I passed verification, but I don't have a happy customer. Okay. So we failed validation. Okay. This validation is making sure that we meet the con ops. Well, the verification, make sure that we meet the requirements. System integration kind of checks out the high-level design. So this is the system engineering B. We use it all the time. It's kind of the basis of, of what we do. Make sense? Okay, next slide. I'll let you read. Everybody see, who's not seen this one before? Everybody's seen this before. Okay, good. So... And occasionally what you find is you're trying to integrate the system and you will find that you are missing a cable, which is kind of equivalent to this, which is kind of the way I feel today. <laughs> but seriously, we um, I found out yesterday we're missing a, a couple key cables in our lab system and I can't cannot have two pieces talk to each other. They need to be able to talk to each other. I feel kind of down. It's sad. Okay, next slide. I'm over it. Uh, okay, so what kind of skills do we need? Obviously problem solving, right? We talked about, we do this because we like to solve hard problems. Who here likes to solve hard problems? Okay, hands down. Who here likes to only solve the easy problems? Good answer, okay, <laughs> okay. May I suggest a different career field? Um, no, we like to solve the hard problems. That's why we do it. That So those are the key skills you, you need. A comp sci degree. A, an electrical engineering degree, um, math, physics, chemistry, all help teach you how to solve hard technical problems. But to tell you the truth, writing a history paper, writing a, an analysis of, of, a, of a Shakespearean play also helps solve those problems. Okay, because it's teaching you to think critically. It's teaching you to look at the evidence that you have in front of you and to figure out what do, what do I know? What do I need to know? What do I need to figure out? How do the pieces relate to each other? And then maybe actually think creatively about how can I now pull it all together and make a solve the problem. Okay, so don't think that you only STEM classes help you with the problem solving. It's everything you're doing, okay? Um, other skills, data analysis, of course, you know, being able to take a huge pile of data and figure out what do I care about? How do I analyze it? How do I plot it? How do I, uh, what statistics do I need to apply? All that. Um, you know, if you're familiar with test equipment, instrumentation, um, who here's working in robotics? 
We've done some. Okay, multimeters, oscilloscopes, spectrum analyzers, lock in amplifiers. Okay, uh, what else? We don't use a lot of lock ins. Um, network analyzers. Okay, so all those types. Uh, tape measures. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, you know, any sort of, of equipment like that, any sort of skills that you have, uh, really help. Obviously, from a software standpoint mm -hmm. now, C, C++, Java are primarily the main languages that we use. Um, anybody do firmware programming, VHDL? <coughs> okay, good. Um, and then scripting, because you always have scripts. I, I'm working on some Perl scripts now, Ruby, Python. I need to put Python on there. Uh, I use MATLAB for most of my data analysis. Excellent tool. If you have a chance to learn and become familiar with it, I highly recommend it. Um, the ability to do research, find the answer, who to ask, where to look it up, uh, be on Google. Okay, sometimes Google is not enough. You need to go on. Wikipedia probably doesn't cut it. Um, you'll find on a lot of these projects, if you're doing the first time ever something's been done, <coughs> you can't look up the answers on the internet. Kind of by definition, right? Which kind of makes it cool. Okay, and writing skills I do have under technical skills. The ability to write and communicate is absolutely, totally critical, no matter what. <coughs> okay, next. Yeah, okay, let's see if the video works. It does, sorry, Chad. It won't. It won't. Yep. You take the specifications from the customers and you bring them down to the software yes. engineers. Yes, yes, that's, that's right. Well, then I just have to ask, why couldn't the customers just take them directly to the software people? Huh? Well, I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, because engineers are not good at dealing with customers. So, you physically take the specs from the customer? Well, no, my secretary does that. Or the guys. So then you must physically bring some of the software to Well, no. Yeah, I mean, sometimes. Um, what, what would you say? By the way, this is how a lot of people see this. Well, look, I've already told you. I deal with the goddamn customers so the engineers don't have to. I have people skills. I am good at dealing with people. Can't you understand this? <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you people? <laughs> okay. It would have been better a cut just like half a second earlier there. Okay, so, you know, so what other skills do we need besides the technical skills? Soft skills. Being able to take the initiative, okay? See the problem, find the problem, ask, do whatever needs to be done to try to find and fix the problem, okay? You need to temper it with, make sure you talk to your supervisor so you're not, you know, spending too much time on something that doesn't matter or things like this, but the ability to go to your supervisor and say, I found this problem, I think this is the best solution, uh, do you want me? To, should I should I try to fix this now or later or what else do you would you rather have me do? It's absolutely totally critical. Okay, um, leadership is also very important. There, are, if you want to advance beyond writing software all by yourself in a queue, your ability to lead people becomes paramount. You, at some point, you get to a point where you. Um, you're responsible for more technical information, more technical responsibility than one person can handle. Okay, so now how do you lead your team to solve that problem? Okay. Excellent communication, also totally, utterly, 100% critical. If you can't communicate, if if either you don't understand what people are, are asking you to do, or um, uh, or you can't express your writings or thoughts or words, like I'm failing right now, um, it'll really hurt. Team player, everything we do is team-based, just pretty much across the board. You're always working together with other people. So understanding how you work in a team, understanding how other people work, 
Um, excellent attitude, good work-life balance, uh, and then finally, do the dirty work. So, you know, sometimes somebody has to sweep the lab. Uh, we have engineers, you know, occasionally pick up a vacuum cleaner and sweep the lab, or um, try to plug in cables or get dirty and, and get down on the floor and, and do whatever needs to be done, literally, or be the one to go through the log file and try to find where the problem was. Okay, so those types of things are, are are really critical. Uh, next slide. I think that pretty much. So next steps. Uh, you know, there are system engineering after you complete a computer science degree. There are graduate degrees in systems engineering. In systems engineering, if that's something that appeals to you, master's degree, um, or the foot in the door career options like be a test engineer or a software engineer. Um, either working on the tools, things like this, or also working on the deliverable code. Um, and Lisa talked a little bit about the job opportunities there. I think the last one is any questions? Yeah, okay, questions? I hear crickets, yes sir. <laughs> okay, uh, I ran a quick Google search for any technology here, or whatever, whatever. Uh -huh. so, uh, they had an opening for a closed-in weapon system technician. Can I ask what a closed-in weapon system is? is closed-in weapon system. system. So yes. Before you go there, yes. Let me let me interrupt and one because we're done at six thirty, right? Uh, for this meeting, for this then. So let me more. kind of take that <coughs> as a leapfrog into making sure everybody knows how to get to what things are and how to look and see what that position is. Okay. Yeah. So really quick. Do you, do you need this or would you like the actual? Right. Go to the that yeah. one right there. So your key will be. To, from a website perspective, it'll be HTTPS, and then you do the slide says it'll be jobs.raytheon.com. From that website, as you scroll down, so you're going to look here under career path, college jobs. So in general, that's where all the internships, co-ops, and the jobs for folks with bachelor's degrees, and master's degrees within 18 months of graduation is all up under the college jobs bucket. <coughs> Those of you that have, if anybody's coming out with a PhD, you would then go look in the professional category. But all the rest of you would go under college jobs and hit search jobs. Don't pick any of the other filters. You may mess yourselves up and miss out on an opportunity. All right, now, so that, again, we are here with all of that. And you'll see that what it did, it posted a lot of stuff. There are currently 337 job openings for Raytheon right now today. That website will always show you what the current openings are. Okay. Now, the, the cool part is you'll see each position, they'll have titles. Some of them you'll actually know what in the world they are. Others are like, but you found them. Like, I don't even know what this is. <laughs> but it sounds cool. Cybersecurity engineer intern? <laughs> yeah, so click on that one. So you can always <laughs> click on the title. It's a hyperlink. And as you scroll down, it'll give you some general overview, usually. And that's all they had. Oh, they have tabs. There we go. So you'll have the success profile, which usually starts talking about, hey, so what do you need? For this position, the people who are hiring say, you need this. Then you see things like the required skills. So right where you are, Ben, is you add. Ah. So see on the left, it has required skills in bold. That lets you see what in the world do I have to have if I want to do this job. And usually I tell students, get to the required spot. And first of all, make sure you've got what they're looking for. So, for example, if you're a computer science major and they're looking for nothing but mechanical engineers, then you know that spot is one you can skip and go back to the list, right? Um, but there will be some others that as you work your way down, he's scrolling, and there's required education. Usually, I will go look there first. So that one in particular says computer engineering, computer science, information security, or something else. Related, you need a three-point minimum on your cumulative GPA. So if that fits you, 
then it's like, okay, cool. Well, let me scroll back up to the top and see what in the world this thing is. And because sometimes you can, most people will read the description first and get excited about it, then scroll to the bottom and go like, oh, well, they need a senior and I'm just a sophomore. I got excited for nothing. So usually that's what I do. I jump all the way to the bottom and go see if it's me and then jump to the top and see if I like it. Yes. I have a question about this uh, search feature. Is there a filter for entry level jobs that we can apply for? Yeah, you can. You can. Now, here's the thing that's special. Um, you can put and uh, try to use the filtering and add some additional filters to it. It's not always all that successful because you can kind of miss out on some things. But here's your key. Usually what I tell folks to do, if I'm going to use a filter, pick the state or states that you're interested in working in and let that be your filter. That will narrow your list down. So you won't look at that 337. But let's say you're only interested in working on the West Coast. So go pick California, Oregon, Washington. See what openings we have out there and let that be your first list. Now, how do you know which ones are my entry level ones? Entry level for a bachelor's, part, bachelor's degree will say engineer one, software engineer one, <coughs> systems engineer one. So there'll be something engineer one, right? Like so, these. I couldn't see that. That's yeah. Well. yeah, there you go. Systems engineer one. Wow. Yeah, systems engineer one. Oh, so when you, when you get up close and we kind of move, it's yeah. kind of hard to see. Yeah. <laughs> but you will see there's a there's a location field. Just go with that. In the title, it'll have mm -hmm. the positions. If it says intern or co-op, then that's not for you if you're looking to try to have an entry-level job, say, in May. Yeah, I, I know for myself, I don't mind moving around. So I was just wondering if there's a way to make sure that the, I don't, that the only jobs that pop up are going to be the ones that require zero use of experience. That's how you do what we were just talking about. So under the college job bucket, yeah. that puts you in that position that you guys are in, fresh out of school. Okay, okay professional yeah. puts you, like for me and Kim. Mm -hmm. So you go to go be y'all, right? So, but that's kind of how you do. The college you jobs at the very the beginning. Piece. Here, and the reason why I, I hesitate on telling you to use those filters, even though they're there, it does not mean that every HR person and every hiring manager checks all the appropriate little boxes. So you could miss out on something trying to make sure you whittled your list down too well. You guys can scan it pretty quickly. It's not like there's thousands of them, right? Because right now today we show 337 total. So that includes the internships and the and the co-ops and the full-time stuff, right? So, but once you found that position that you said, oh, this is cool, and I would really like to live wherever this is, and I meet those requirements, you can apply right there online which is cool. The other piece is you can set up the RSS search thing, so it will notify you when other positions like that become available, which also makes your life pretty simple. You can check your own status online, which is also useful. So in the interest of time, we've hit that 630 mark, but that's what you do and where you go to go see what our openings are and Hey, and if you're wanting to see, well, what do software engineers do at Raytheon? You can see right now what our entry level or even our co-op and intern level software engineers do for Raytheon that we're trying to bring in today. Is that all right? Cool. And to clean the stack, close-in weapon system is um, the phalanx, or I think there's also a missile system used to protect uh, ships at sea. So when missiles or incoming things are really close, we try to shoot down the incoming thing. CIWS. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. 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 One quick question. Yes. Will the presentation you used today be made available to us? On I the yes. 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 Okay. It's on there now. Yes. Okay. Um. Yeah. Any other questions from the group? All right. We are going to pick up. Uh, Shortly uh, for the ACMW, Raytheon is going to continue present, uh, presenting 
uh, but on the subject of women in the defense industry, uh, I want to emphasize this is totally something that, like, anyone can hang around, chill with us for. Um, it's important conversations. I'm really excited to hear what Lisa has to say. Um, but if you're going to be heading out, go ahead and give Raytheon a round of applause for coming up here to see you. Is there any way that uh, if someone has further questions that they weren't able to address, they can get a hold oh, of hey, you? Uh, get a hold of me? Yes. Uh, yeah, send so, so my email. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'll go if you're here for CS1 extra credit, or you're obviously not here for that. If you, uh, <laughs> anyway, if you want CS1 extra credit, put your name on this, and I'll collect it. Mm. I'll stay at all fashion CS1. It won't break away like the board. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
to a came to an assignment and was like, hey, there's uh, defense, uh, a presentation of systems in the defense. I had a lie. I was like, I was like, I was like, did you get an opportunity to talk? Like, this was a cool thing. Glad to hear it. Did you get an opportunity to talk to Dr. Myers? Yeah, I told him I didn't go to talk. Okay. He doesn't know who I am, so that's fine. Don't worry about it. All right. Well, cool. Yeah. Uh, this was good. Yeah. No, this was a, this was really really nice. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm gonna go upstairs and play bridge. Should we come up later? Bridge. Yeah. Come play bridge. I never played bridge. I'm gonna teach you. Is it is it? Um, I've been doing robotics for what is that? Eight to seven days. Yeah. Other time. Yeah. So normally. Wednesdays at 6.30. As soon as we get four people, there'll be people playing bridge anytime okay, six after. 6.30. Yeah. I might be able to come sometime. Uh, yeah, I'm going to show you how friendly to teach people. I didn't even realize that thing. Two years later, I still remember that thing, but I have a good time. Oh, yeah. 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 Ye
you know, a little a different feel. But yes. So, um, as you'll see on the board, so I'm Lisa Moore, and I'm a Sooner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the first I mean, step of a 12 step program, it sounds. <laughs> yeah. No, you know how it goes sooner born, sooner bred. Uh, the, um, but it's kind of cool being here on this campus. So I'm born and raised in Oklahoma City. And uh, so it's cool being back in the state where the dirt is red and not uh, the strange orangey. Weird color that's in Texas. Um, so this is good, and I have been. I was telling Ken I have not been on this campus since I was a high school senior, and it's like, wow, man, that's changed a lot. It has, but it's still cool, and it's you know, and it's it, it's like oh, I remember seeing that. I remember being in the union, and then a lot is fuzzy, <laughs> but it's like this looks pretty cool, and so I'm glad to be here. Um, I am as Ben mentioned earlier, I'm a principal systems engineer with Raytheon. Senior. And, yes, yeah, senior principal. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that's that is difference. kind of important. Yes, it really is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, so I've been with Raytheon since the summer after my sophomore year. So I was a summer intern back in the day. And, oh man, that was cool. Um, so the thing about it is I didn't know at the time that I said, okay, I'm going to go work for these people, um, I didn't know for sure that I was going to stay in engineering. I was telling Ken on the way up that um, if that internship had not gone well, I had already made preparations on campus to change my major. So I was an electrical engineering major with the computer option, which is now called the computer engineering degree. So, but that's what I was. And I was cool freshman year. I'm like, okay, all right, I'm in engineering, this is gonna be all right. Sophomore year, I bumped into some classes that I, we, we did not like each other. I do not, sorry Kim, but I don't like Sir Isaac Newton. <laughs> at all. <laughs> I like don't. <laughs> well, yes, we, we, do, we did not get along. Um, and of course, that's the front half of the physics book. And then, of course, to try to make us well-rounded electrical engineers, of course, we had to take these other classes that spent a lot of time in the front half of the physics book. Rigid body mechanics, otherwise known as statics and dynamics and all of that. And then there was the thermodynamics class. And I was like, oh, I don't like this man. I don't. I don't like this man. I don't like his stuff. I like the second half of the physics book with the waves and, you know, and, you know, and, and, and all that cool stuff in the second half. No, they made me take these classes in the front half and only one class. There was one programming class. I was like, okay, well, now this is cool. And then there was... Um, you know, an electrical engineering class, like, all right, now I like this, but this other stuff these people are making me take, I don't like. And, um, and I was thinking, well, maybe I'm supposed to be something else. Surely I'm in the wrong thing. And then you look around and there, there are folks in my classes that have tinkered with stuff before. And so they knew some things, you know, they liked they, wrong word, they love programming. <laughs> yeah, I can do it. And I made my A's, but okay, I didn't love programming. So it's like, well, sh I must be in the wrong place. Gotta be. But the internship opportunity came up and I told my parents, okay, so I'm going to try this. But if this doesn't work out, when I come back, I'm changing my major. I'm going to do a double major in math and music performance was the plan. I had already mm -hmm. talked to the professors I liked in the math department, and we had a plan. We had figured out what I could do over there that would fit with what I like doing and with what they taught. And I went and talked to the folks in the music department. I had my music scholarship lined up. and. I was set. My backup plan was queued up. And then I went to work. 
for these people. I had a blast. I who knew work could be fun, um, and it was. I got to um, now. I guess part of the key is so I was the only female on that whole at, that was not doing software. So I was over on the hardware side of the house, and I'm the only one. Okay, so some of you have experienced that. You know, you're the only one in the room. Okay, so that was it, but it wasn't a problem. I was working with some really cool guys. So they, there were no differentiations made between any of us. There was, a, there was a real legit new guy from South Dakota School of Mines. Who and I had never heard of South <laughs> Dakota School of Mines, but apparently from they Georgia. are very, very good. But I know from that Georgia. now. But no, that was not who it was. There was another guy, Steve. <laughs> And we both started the same day. My program had never had an intern before, so they didn't know what to do special with me, so they had me go through all the new hire stuff with my new buddy, Steve. Because <laughs> lo and behold, we were on the same program. And so they go and they give me my assignment. I hey, so I'm doing card testing. Ooh, okay, I'd never done that before, but I'd never touched a real, honest to goodness, real people's card. You know, you had breadboards and stuff as a double E in the lab. We never had a real something that you plug into a test set. And so I was a whole lot skinnier then. And you were supposed to put the card on the test set and it had this vacuum suction on it. Well, I promise I may have weighed maybe 115 pounds. I told you a whole lot skinnier. And so I had to jump up and push down on the thing to get it to seat on the test set. But part of my thing was to test out these new cards that the, you know, the real engineers were had been making. Figure out what's wrong with them so we can get them fixed. So take them over there to the technician so they can fix what I found. Thinking, hey, this is cool. And I had to do that all by myself. It was a it was a thing. I got responsibility. They let me do stuff and they treated made me just like every other engineer that's working there. Like, hey, this is cool. And what we're getting to do in school. That's fine. And the project we were on was just awesome. And like I said, I was part of the team doing the same stuff, kind of things everybody else was doing. I called my parents and said, I don't think I'm changing my major. I think I'm going to stay with this. And it was really a lot of fun. Um, so I kept coming back every summer to work for folks. And um, matter of fact, the second summer, I came back to that same program in McKinney. And lo and behold, they kept my desk and the stuff that was in it. It's like these people wanted me back. <laughs> and I must really belong here because I'm in the same spot. But this time I was playing software like stuff. So, still with the, these test sets, but I'm supposed to be updating the test software. I didn't even know that test software existed because I always thought software was the stuff that you wrote that was doing the main thing. Who knew that you had to have code? that actually test the hardware. You know, I never really stopped to think about how you went and tested it other than the manual stuff. But when I thought about that test set I was working on the previous summer, it was automated. <laughs> then I'm like, oh, well, somebody would have to write code for that. And so I'm learning a whole new language that they never taught at school. I mean, because you learn things back in the day, Fortran was the biggie that they made everybody take. And, you know, you, of course, for some of your classes, you had to go learn somebody's assembly language. But this was for this mainframe. Who taught mainframe programming languages? So they, you know, but of course, it's kind of like what Steve was, Kim was alluding to, you get these, once you learn how to program, switching to another language, isn't really all that bad. You got to go learn the new syntax, learn the new rules for how they do things. But your basic thought processes are kind of the same. So, yeah. So I had to learn a whole new language, had books and 
Okay, well, what is this doing? Because they said that, one, you got to fix the old stuff, but then update it to go on this new test set. Oh, well, okay. And I'm thinking, well, I've never done this before. But it was cool. It was mine. Nobody else was doing it but me. This was my responsibility to handle it. Well, okay. And maybe, maybe I have a switch to CS when this is over. Maybe that's, you know, because I'm still trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. And so I do that in the summer and still. But we found things. And just like the previous summer, I was making real contributions and doing stuff. Yeah. This is cool. But I think I decided, well, I, I like software, but I like the hardware thing too, so I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I was still kind of on the fence, which I guess was good being a computer engineering major, because, okay, I was still kind of a hybrid-like. Uh, so yeah, but so every summer, I went back. I did five internships. So all the way through undergrad, Partway through the master's. Now you'll notice on there, you don't see that there's a master's degree listed for me because halfway through, I was burned out. And like, you know, I, don't go back. I was doing really cool stuff. So back in the day when hearing aids were analog, my research project was on digital hearing aids. And I'm like, oh, it was cool. And I'm just thinking now, folks have them. And it's like, I was working on that. I was working on that and how, yeah, cool stuff. But nevertheless, before I go up on a very big tangent, but it was, it was a cool thing to me. And the hardest part was telling my advisor, okay, I, I don't really want to come back. Is that, I'm sorry. You know, I felt so bad. Because well, I didn't know, I mean, I had never done that before. But I got to say so again, I've been with Raytheon now for, including my summers, 29 years. Good grief. Mm -hmm. It's scary when I think about it. I get to turn 30 next summer. <laughs> it's like, wow. But that's, um, so I've been with them for a long time. Now, some folks may ask, did you plan this, you know, to be, you know, at this one company that long and in the defense industry and all that? No. It was really not planned that way. I mean, I had fun in all my summers. Well, all of them but one. One was kind of a dud. Um, yeah, it wasn't a good fit. But, you know, I guess everything just can't all be great. But, yeah, one dud summer out of five isn't, isn't bad. But, um, you know, I figured, well, I'll, I'll be here for maybe five years. Then I'll do something else. I didn't have any idea what that something else was going to be. Um, but it turned out, I kept enjoying what I was doing. And, you know, it, for the most part, things were going kind of drama free. And, and back then, when I, in my early part of the career, our badges were color coded based on how many years you worked there. So your first five years, you had a red badge. Next five, you were blue. So I figured, all right, I get the blue badge, I'm good. Okay, I, I'll keep my eyes open and maybe I'll do something else. But my goal is to end up with a blue badge. After the blue badge, the next five years, you were yellow. Then the next five was gray. I didn't really want the gray badge. It didn't look good at all. <laughs> <laughs> and then once you hit the 20 year mark, you went gold. This like, now, if I just so happen to still be here, now the gold badge would be cool. And then every five years after that, they start to add a star or something else to the gold badge. And you got all the close parking spots if you were a gold badger. And so I was like, man, if I stay, you know, I could stick around and be gold. This is Texas Instruments. You heard it, too. Yes. Not Raytheon. Yeah, but we hadn't been sold yet. Right. So, but that was kind of how things were playing out. And lo and behold, just as I was getting ready to be yellow, my part of the company got sold to Mother Raytheon. And they didn't do badges. 
that were that were color coded. I was so disappointed because I was all set, and it's like, okay, I was gonna live through the gray period, but I was gonna get to be gold because it was kind of looking that way. Because my thoughts always were, I'll stick around as long as I like them and they like me. And so apparently we're still liking each other because, like I said, it's been 29 years. Um, and then folks ask, okay, well, Lisa, how about you in defense? I mean, how in the world did you end up in the defense industry? All right, well, so first part of that, I grew up here in Oklahoma. And what do we have a lot of? Bases. <laughs> so it was common. So I'm a Midwest City bomber. And so, of course, that means we're right there at Tinker. And because we're right there at Tinker and I'm a bomber, the wrestling team was always up for state. So, and you're going up there by Vance Air Force Base and all that stuff to go support and all that. So, it was a common thing. Here it is in high school and everybody takes the ASVAB. And I didn't know until like recent years that that didn't happen at everybody's school. I thought it was just the thing. You took the ACT, the SAT, and the ASVAB. Who knew that everybody didn't do that? So, but it was a normal thing. The base is there. We all, I went to Monroney Junior High. We always had the Thunderbird flyovers for homecoming. Bomber flyovers for Midwest City homecoming. It was a thing. So the whole defense industry deal was, I mean, it seemed like a cool deal. And then I was the one who all, who was always hooked on those spy TV shows, you know, and so there was a period, because it's not even in syndication anymore, but it was Scarecrow and Mrs. King was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I liked that one. If you can find it somewhere, it was actually pretty cool, because the one, because the guy they called, the secret agent they called Scarecrow drove a really nice Porsche. Um, but mm -hmm. I always liked the cool gadgets. Back going way back, the six million dollar man and the bionic woman were always a cool thing, and always with the agency and, and doing this cool stuff. So I always liked those things growing up. I never, you know, I didn't think I was aiming in that direction. I thought NASA would be cool. You know, I used to think I wanted to be an astronaut, but I'm scared of heights. And when I learned that the door <laughs> was way up there, and it's like, I don't think I can be one of those. Um, but, you know, the mission control thing looked kind of cool. Disney looked really cool. It's like, I could be an Imagineer. I could do that. Um, but they only came to recruit at OU once, so there wasn't a... There weren't many opportunities, and I didn't think about, okay, well, you could have just written in or whatever and put your two cents that way. But I'm thinking that could be cool, and I could live in Florida. I'm not going to California where the earth moves more than this does here these days. But I was thinking, but I could be in Florida and be an Imagineer. That could be cool. And But as I moved up through you know, my education and you're talking to people when they would come to campus, and I started figuring out the stuff that I didn't want. Oil and gas recruits heavy in the state, but okay, I, I didn't want to be out in the middle of nowhere because that didn't quite fit me. So I wanted to be in a little bigger city than Midland. <laughs> or this, or that. That, wasn't, that wasn't quite where I wanted to be. And to be totally honest, okay, I did not want to go to a city where I am probably 1% of the population. So I wanted to at least improve my odds a little bit. So I figured at least going to a halfway decent sized city would kind of make things, you know, pretty decent. The, um, I don't like cold, so I couldn't go to like Chicago and New York and all of that because, well, it's cold. Up there. So, you know, you start narrowing down your, your options. You know, 3M has a bunch of stuff up in Minnesota, and they seemed really cool, but okay, but it's Minnesota, and <laughs> I, can't, I can't go there. Because um, if y'all would ever see me in the wintertime, I'm bundled. And Ken is laughing. You were a hood nine months of the, out of the year, right? 
Because they have the air conditioning up to, to um, turn um, down to snow in the labs. That, that's why that's over there. Because you just never know. People decide they want to go work things out. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> you know, so, but it's in the figuring out. And the internship was really helpful because I discovered, hey, this the <coughs> thing is actually kind of cool to me. And I kind of like this. And I like this environment. And it... And I discovered it really kind of fit in with a lot of the stuff I was watching on TV that I thought was really cool. It was like, ooh, I, I'm not part of the agency, but still, this is cool. Um, you know, and then, you know, like I said, being here in Oklahoma with the folks who are in the service. Now, my, my folks weren't active. Come, you know, my dad served, you know, long before I was born. But so growing up, I didn't know. But I just thought, okay, but yeah, but this would be cool. I could do that. I can't be in the military. I'm not that great at following instructions the way that I would need to follow instructions. Um, so, but this would be a way that I could I could be helpful and go on. And then I started discovering as I've gone on in my career that I like complex things. I mean, not everybody does, but I like complex things, and I like things that are kind of chaotic. Who knew? Okay, so this is kind of what that is. And it turns out that there's a lot of stuff in our industry that fits that. There are other industries that are more repetitious than I can handle personally. Like, take cell phones. iPhones in particular. iPhones have been looking pretty much the same for a while. And now folks are getting excited about the 10 or the X, whichever way you want to call it. But from a hardware person perspective, okay, but it's still a phone. <laughs> I mean, there are only so many basic working parts to a phone. You've got the talking part, the listening part. You've got your input stuff. And you've got a camera. And you've got processors and some sensors. Memory. Okay, I'm thinking I am not that excited. I mean, if I did, buggy. Huh? It's not a laser doom buggy. No, no, it's, it's, it's not. It's not. Cars have more. Cars have more parts and more things to mess with. Um, but I was thinking, okay, but if I work for GM in Oklahoma City, okay, but I'm gonna be fooling with the same kind of cars or trucks for like years, and that didn't. I, I told you, I need chaos. I need complexity, and so yeah, so I needed stuff that was gonna be weird enough that I've got this challenge every day. Now, so that's why Raytheon kind of worked for me, rather than some other things that I could have done. But this ended up working. The, what's it like being a, a woman in the, woman engineer and a woman in defense? Um, for me, for the most part, it's typical. So I'm a musician also. I play brass instruments. Brass sections are mostly guys. So I've been doing mostly guys stuff for a long time. So it's not a new thing for me personally to be in a mostly guy environment. Now, it is kind of interesting for some of the guys who've only been in all guy environments to have to then have me in the room. So some of them have to make some adjustments. And most of them, you know, it's not a big deal. Okay, it's just another engineer. So we're all cool because it's, all about the what you bring to the table as opposed to what you look like. And fortunately for me, I'd say maybe 99% of the people that I've worked with haven't cared what I look like at all. Which for me is pretty cool because it's kind of in the immaterial bucket because the engineer in me says it's about what you do. So I've had, I haven't had a lot of drama just for me being me. Um, now, there was that 1%. And he's gone now. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, there were really only two. There were only two. And I'm glad they moved on to do other things and we're no longer occupying the same space. Um, but, like I said, everything else has been cool. And, um, you know, I was thinking, I had talked to... Um, the group, they have a Women in Electrical and Computer Engineering at OU that they started a couple years ago. And I was talking to them last semester. Yeah, it was in the spring. And about this same kind of topic. 
And it was, of course, not long after Hidden Figures came out. So I read the movie. I mean, read that. <laughs> I had seen the movie. And I read the book. Reading the book had way more detail in it than the movie did. And it was interesting to see in the book that the defense industry was on the forefront of putting women in engineering and in computer science. I didn't know. Who knew? I had spent all this time in this STEM stuff and didn't know till last year that that's, well, not last year, but last semester, that that's how that played out. And it's like, oh, well, cool. You know, it's, it's from a history perspective, hey, I'm in the industry that was first in doing a lot of that. The defense industry was on the forefront of hiring women regardless of color and then women that look like me. And it's like, hey, who knew? And it's like, okay, well, this is cool. And um, so, yeah, so there's this long history going back into the 40s, who knew, that this industry's been doing that. It's like, wow, that's kind of cool. So, and I want to make sure that before I talk for the entire hour, that I give you guys a chance to ask questions. So I'm gonna open the floor and pause for a moment. Yes. <laughs> did you have any problems when you were a student? Did you did you encounter like any kind of felt like you maybe treated you differently as a student when you were a student? Yes, but not by my fellow students because we were all in the same boat as students, you know, and um, and especially when. Okay, so I was at OU in the late 80s. And so as an electrical engineering major, I was typically the only girl in the class. Okay, but the guys in my class didn't seem to care. Well, let me rephrase that. I was typically the only US born girl in my class. Okay, so I do have to kind of clarify that one. Um, so, you know, all the guys who were also from the U.S., we all ended up, you know, we were all just studying together because, okay, we all understood each other. And okay, cool. And then at OU, we had, um, at the time, what was called the Minority Engineering Program that was dealing primarily with Blacks, Hispanics, and American Indians. Now, anybody could come and be a part of the group, but that was the target. So, you know, we all hung together and helped each other out. So that was an additional support area. And so, yeah. Now, from a faculty perspective, most of my professors didn't seem to care one way or the other. We were all minions and we're, we, none of us were real engineers. It's, yeah, it's like we were pledging. And we weren't legit yet. You, we were all just wannabe engineers. And so they treated us all the same way, like we were wannabe and had not yet earned the right to call ourselves engineers. So, um, you know, so most of them, you know, they treated all of us that same kind of way. I only had one, I only had one who was problematic. And because in, in hindsight, I learned the backstory. Because enrollment had increased, the student-faculty ratio was bigger than what they wanted it to be. So they brought this one guy back from retirement. They should have left him. <laughs> now, granted, technically, the man was awesome. He's one of those high-ranking, highly recognized nationally kind of people. But he, he kind of, he was patronizing. So, I mean, now granted, that's different from the ones that, you know, are a little more hostile in their thoughts. But this one was patronizing, you know. The end result was from the impression I got was I didn't belong in, in this program. You know, it's so nice that you're in here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and okay, I, I, and what was I, 20? Yeah, 20. I wasn't equipped to deal with a grown up treating me that way. I had never really encountered that, the whole patronizing thing. I, I don't know, I can't 
I'm supposed to do with this? I mean, this is the man that, you know, is going to give my grade. Yeah, and that didn't work out well either. Um, <laughs> so there ended up being this after the cement, you know, you get surprised. Because the big kicker in this particular saga, um, Nesby National Conference was in March. It, I'm an officer in Nesby. And so the beginning of the semester, I go tell all my professors, hey, so these two days, I'm going to be out of town, you know, Thursday and Friday, and then, of course, the Saturday, Sunday thing, the four-day conference. So I'm going to be at Nesby Nationals, so if there's homework or tests or something that I need to do, you know, can I do it early? And I just want to tell you the beginning of the semester, so, you know, you know I'm not just trying to get out of stuff. Oh, and oh, well, things are fine, and we're going to work it out. Get close to time to go. Do the reminder, right? Because it's not like it's the first time I've been in the conference. It's like you go to inform people. And of course, oh, everything's fine, but of course there's a test schedule. Well, I'm gone. Okay, can I take it early? No, you can't take it early. Oh, because I might tell other people what the answers are, so I can't take it early. Yeah. <clears throat> and so it's, uh, but everything's going to be all right, you know, and we'll just count the final to the final we'll just let that double it's like all right that's not bad because on the syllabus it says it's open book open note now it's, all right cool the week before finals we have the last non-final test right do the test here we go and get the grade back i got a hundred on my test and it's like all right i'm good shape for finals right Studying me and my me and my little group. There were three of us, and so the three guys and me, and we're studying, you know, all week and prepping. And we get to <coughs> the final. Again, open book, open up. We've been practicing, so we're ready. You go in, and you look. Is it the same as that test we just took? I mean, exactly the same. It's like, oh, well, I'm home free now because I got 100 on that one and I had that paper sitting right here. So what do you do, open book, open note, when the problem is sitting right there? Copy what I did before onto the new thing, turn it in. Get my report card in the mail and there is a D in that man's class. And I'm like, you know, I'm standing at the mailbox looking at <laughs> it. Yeah, how? Because I got that. And then, so not only the how did I get that, but how in the world am I walking into this house and telling my parents? Yeah, so I went in and showed them, and I went to explain it. Okay, I don't understand. That's it, maybe... You ought to call and set up a meeting with your professor. Like, that makes sense. That's what you do. That's what I'm supposed to do. You know, call, make an appointment, go up there to meet him, and he's late. He's not there. Now, the hardest professor in the whole double E department, they still talk about this man, and he's been retired for well over 10, 15 years. <laughs> but his office was nearby. And he's talking to me, and my dad came with me. And because, you know, I wasn't in a good place. I was, I wasn't quite understanding how this was working and moral support. Because he wasn't going to say anything, he was just going to sit. And um, I'm talking to our other professor and explaining to him what's going on. Because I had that other man, the hard one, for three, three different classes. He is, he, oh, good grief, he was hard. But he was fair. He was um, hey, now, so we're talking, and he said, well, I'm sure this will this will work out. Because he's had me three times, so he kind of kinda knows. The other man shows up, going to his office, and the way he explained it was, oh, well, 
I didn't really grade that other one. I just put a hundred down on there for it, and you really didn't work any of that right. So that's why the last grade that, of course, we counted twice. Yeah, you missed all of those. Yeah, games. Um, so yeah, that that didn't go too well. That didn't go too well at all. Um, so yeah. The paper you supposedly graded, you didn't really grade. But you didn't tell anybody you didn't really grade. And you for sure didn't tell me. An open book, open note would. Who thought you had to go really legitimately work it from scratch? And if I didn't know I had worked it wrong over here because you didn't say it was wrong? Yeah. So that was my only drama <laughs> in that scenario. And But there was no proof that... Okay, so you couldn't, like, go to the dean and say, this man messed me over. Because he'll say, you're supposed to work the problem. It's your open book, open note stuff is a resource you're supposed to start. Yeah. Question. Um, in the workplace, have you run across people, men, talking over you, um, taking credit? doing other things that men typically, or sometimes do. <laughs> so, I don't say typically. <laughs> that's, that's maybe a bit, but. Uh, so the... You got the gist of the question. Yeah, the gist of the question. So the answer is yes, I've experienced it. Um, now the, the talking over, not so much because I'm a woman, but because that's just who they are. They talk over everybody. And so, and so part of the thing is because it's my comfort zone to be in the background and my preference is to not be confrontational, although I am able, but my preference is not to be confrontational. That's what's going to say. Now, there will come a point when it's like, okay. I need to go on and say what I need to say and talk over these others who are not letting me butt in. So, yeah, there are times I have to go on and on purpose go do that. Um, you know, and sometimes it'll depend on my mood. Sometimes, okay, I'll let them finish rambling and do what they got to do, then I'll say mine, and then there are others. And now it's important enough, and you've gone off on a tangent that has nothing to do with where we are, and let me go on and bring this back to where it needs to be. So I'll do it when I need to. Have I had folks taking credit for stuff that I've done? Yes, absolutely. And I and so I've had to address that. I had one one guy early on who who did that. Um, and I talked to my boss about, okay, so what am I supposed to do? How do I handle that? Because all right, because I was taught in that very first summer internship I had, document everything. Leave a paper trail, keep your stuff. And so I had my paper trail. And I was like, now nah, I can show you that now nah, I'm the one who did it. He asked. I provided the answer. But now he's acting like it's his. And he said, well, you can talk to him. So I talked to him. I brought it up. And it's like, hey, this, you know, it's just not cool. But of course, you know, nobody ever says, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I, I wasn't doing it intentionally. I nobody ever does that. They, folks always act like, no, nah, I didn't do that. And it's like, all right, but I can fix that, too. I cannot provide you with answers. Just like when I was, you know, junior high and high school and folks would want to copy off my paper and get what I did. Okay, I can help you not copy. So if you want to be the one standing up in the status meeting acting like you did this, I just won't tell you what I've been up to and let you just do just your own and I'll handle mine. Okay, we can bless you. So we can work those kinds of things out. Um, but yeah, but those those weren't regular. You know, they do they did they occur? Yeah. Um, part of the thing was me being comfortable standing on my own two feet in front of other people, and that was a thing. So even if for example, I'm in school and in the lab, and there are folks who seemingly know what they're doing, and I don't have a clue. 
but I still need to be bold enough to go say, okay, let me try, because I had never done this before, so can I need to have a turn instead of just being the note taker. Because that's the other thing that can happen a lot in industry is that if you've got good communication skills, you tend to get to be the one to be Madam Secretary um, and that kind of thing. And of course, you always need a secretary, but it doesn't always need to be me. Eleanor so, Foltz found that she was often mm -hmm. asked to be the secretary yeah. in every meeting that she was in. Yeah. And the only trend was that she was female. Yeah, and, and writes well. And the assumption is, okay, if you're female, you're going to write. And at some point, you say, oh, no, somebody else can do that. No, that's okay. You know, you find a way to decline. Because sometimes you do things for the good of the team, and then there's some other time. Now somebody else needs to handle that. Because it doesn't always have to be me. Yes, I type fast, but that's because I play the piano. So, But other folks can handle that over there. And it'll be all right that they do that. It will be all right that I'm in charge. And you're following. It's It's okay. And there'll be an opportunity that you'll be in charge and I'll follow. But it doesn't always have to be that I'm in follow mode or that I'm going to help when we have, you know, some shindig at work and we've got food and everything. Okay, I'm not always going to be the one that's helping serve. I am able. I was taught. But these other folks in here can do that. They can pick up plates and forks and spoon stuff onto a plate <laughs> to somebody and say, here you go. It doesn't always have to be me. Um, you know, so that there, there are times, you know, you say no. We've had conversations, um, like in our first meeting, that I don't want to say females in general, but it's not uncommon for a female to not want to be confrontational. And I think just listening to you talk, I can hear you changing something negative into a positive. No, that's okay. You can do it. Or <laughs> I don't have to do it this time. <laughs> yeah. So I'm hear so I'm hearing just your personality, you have an ability to turn something into a positive statement. You can say no in a positive way. And I think that's a really nice skill that one might want to develop in order to deal with those kinds of situations. So what I find interesting is we've been in zillions of meetings together. And she always sits in the back of the room. <laughs> and, and you said non confrontational, yeah. and I always picture you. I sit at the table yeah. by design so that I am part of that central conversation. And so, and I will, and so in that particular set of meetings that we were in daily, good grief. So I was the, <laughs> I was the new person okay. to the team. And amongst the midst of all of the people in the room, I was also the most junior uh -oh. at the time. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the time. Yeah. And so figure, all right, look, I need to kind of get the lay of the land. Because, you know, there, there will be certain things. You're going to see me at the head of the table because that's where I'm supposed to be. Um, and because if you take a look, because I didn't really talk about it, but those the, those last three things on there, um, I'm at the head of the table. <laughs> and so the cool thing about it is, um, I will pick and, I tend to pick and choose when I'm going to be there, so even in this same set of meetings. Now, if I'm supposed to have a major role in that conversation, I'm at the table. If I know that, okay, we're just doing, you're going to hear from me for about 45 seconds, there's no need for me to be at the table other than to prove a point. And I figure there'll be opportunities for me to make that point. Because the um, a thing that I had heard a long time ago was that um, it's better to be asked to sit at the table than to be asked to go sit somewhere else. It's like <laughs> in the Bible. <laughs> 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 uh, it, it really is. And um, 
actually uh, in no, 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 it's, it's not in Proverbs. It's in the New Testament. Yeah, it's in it's Jesus. in the Gospels. <laughs> yeah, it's in one of the Gospels. And um, so, with that in mind, you know, I, I pick and choose because it is very easy. It's easy in the desire to prove a point, to demonstrate that yes, I do belong here. Um, and yes, not only do I belong here, but yes, I do have this position for a reason. I'm not a token. This is not a check the box position. There's a, a person could be confrontational and could be itchy without using the first word that goes with, first letter that goes in that word. Um, but there's some folks who are. And I figure that mentality will only take you so far. It won't, because I like to collaborate. I like to be able to pull all the right people together for us to go solve these complex problems. And if I've made you my enemy, now what happens when I'm gonna ask you to help with something? You're not gonna wanna help me, right? Because, okay, now why in the world would I wanna work for this person who's always complaining, always fussing, always talking bad about people, why would I want to work for that person? Whereas, now, there, there are times my initial response will always be to try to do it nicely. But it's just like when I'm fooling with my nephew. I'll start nicely. And then there's the, the other thing that'll have to come out when nicely doesn't work. Um, but I prefer the nice version. Um, we had, I told a story to the leadership class at OU a couple years ago. I had a, in the defense industry, you get an interesting mix of people. So you get folks who are in there fresh out of school. And so you've got your degree engineers fresh out of school. You've got those who went to the service first and then went to school. Um, and then you have folks who might be, might have been career military and are now, say, technicians or field service folks or something else. Um, but some folks have never had the opportunity to work for a woman before. And so I had a group of guys, and a few of them, this was their first time. And um, what they didn't know is that I hear very well, which kind of comes in handy being a musician, is the hearing very well. And so, yeah, I heard the things that were mumbled. Um, you know, okay, all oh, folks have to have their adjustment period, so I kind of let that be. But there came a time when, um, we were in the lab, and I'm telling the guys, hey, look, so we're going to have company today. We have visitors coming in, you know, and so this is what needs to happen. When company comes, whether you're, whether anything is really going on or not, I need you to fake like it is. So pretend, you know, so go over there to the equipment and fake it. Don't read the paper. You know, because sometimes if you've got a test that takes an hour to run, you've started it, you've got time to kill. So sometimes we're sitting around talking or doing other things. Somebody might catch up on the paper for a minute. But this is not the time. I need everybody to act like you're doing real work, whether you are or not. Because I've got to play tour guide. And I'm going to be taking folks past where you'll be sitting, and I'll be taking them to the back of the lab. So while they're in here, Thank you. Okay, now, that seems to be pretty straightforward set of instructions, right? Because you know what you normally do. <laughs> so, here we go. The tour, tour folks were late. Goodness, so, yeah. They, they tease me in these meetings because I'm always doing something with my hands. This is one that they messed with me about last week. Charlie got me last week. And... <laughs> He was waiting for that, and yeah, because we don't sit in meetings all the time anymore. But these folks, like the tour group was late, and our guys said, we, none of us have gone to lunch yet, because we're supposed to be in here when the people come. They finally come in, 
my guys doing a great job. They're faking it really well. I'm standing behind these people aren't doing real work. I know that. But the, the people on the tour don't know any different. Good. I'm saying, guys are doing well. And we move on to the back of the room. And so if my guys are like where you are in the back, and you guys up here are the tour group that I'm talking to, and I'm pointing out these things back this way. And I'm looking. I got one man who's got his feet propped up on the table. I got to, just like, okay, Lisa, keep your poker face. Keep your poker face. Don't you let on that you're looking back there because I need these people to stay focused up this way. Because these people, my guys, Quit faking it. We're still in the room. <laughs> We're up here. They're back there. Like, we've left. It's like if anybody had turned around. We were holes. I was like, okay, I right, Lord, help me keep these people pointed this way. <laughs> these people, there, and don't let me, don't let, don't let my face show. But I'm really thinking, because my thought are, what are these fools doing back right there? I told them to fake it then. Okay, Lisa, don't freak out, don't freak out, don't panic. <laughs> Continue doing the tour. Do the tour, take them into the room next door. And it's like, and I'll take them out that other door, because I can't walk past these people. We finish the tour, I get them out, give them to the next batch of folks. I walk back in the room, and you know, do I know these people? Uh, no, okay. you don't. You don't know them. You don't know them. <laughs> uh uh. No. Uh -uh. No, they they're doing other things now. <laughs> <laughs> but we had to have a conversation, and it was in. And I'll I'll give you the tone of voice because it's different than what we had just had. What part of sit here and fake it did you not understand? I told you while we're doing the tour that if you aren't doing anything, I need you to sit here and fake it. And what in the world are you doing with your feelings? Take your feet off the table. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to make this clear. The next time I have to bring folks in here for a tour, you don't move till I tell you. You are only allowed to breathe and blink. <laughs> Is everybody clear? <laughs> And it's like, okay, I shouldn't have to do that to grown people. <laughs> what part of sit here and fake it? Do you not understand? <laughs> so yeah, so there are times when the not nice part has to come out. Um, but I try to save that for when it's absolutely necessary. Because well, their understanding was bad. And I guess they needed to see a different thing to help, uh, help them understand, no, this is how this is going to work. But yeah, in general, things go pretty well. So we'll do one more question or two, and then we're probably going to have to bail out of here because one, it's 734, mm -hmm. and we do have to drive back to that one. <laughs> so did y'all have any other questions? So how many other women are in your area? Are in? there other, or do they feel intimidated to apply to work? No. Or? So there are. So unfortunately, I can count them. One day, we will be at the point where I where I'm not able to count. Um, but in my in my regular daily thing, um, there are two others that I encounter on a regular basis. Um, we're not doing the same thing, but we're on the same project. Um, there are yeah, there are four that I encounter regularly on this, on the project I'm on now, and there's one more on the one that I used to be on. So yeah, well, I can do the five for so in my regular day. Makes them feel intimidated to try to apply to those positions? Or no, it's not so much that. Um, so, combination of things. One, back in the day, there weren't just that many of us. Okay, I know when I graduated from OU, Sitting in there, May 91, I was the only black female in the College of Engineering. I mean, and I knew that. I can, but I go back and they show us the stats. And it's like, oh yeah, there's me. There's me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so fortunately,
fortunately, numbers have gotten way better. You know, you guys are in things. And, but no, the numbers were small then, which then means that by the time you get, and you've been around as long as I have, things dwindle. Why? Because um, stereotypically, women will have good communication skills. So there comes a point when, as we were talking about that tech ladder, when the split finally happens, that dual ladder, and you can either be management or technical, the opportunities come very quickly for the technical side of the house. Because we speak well, stereotypically. Not everybody does. Or you write well. You have good people skills. You can, you know, you can work with the customers. You can deal with these other people. Oh, this will be great. And yeah. And you look at it, hey, it's an opportunity to rise and climb and new titles and this and that. Um, there are, as hardware folks, even though I'm systems, I'm, I still think of myself as a hardware person. And even though I'm leading a software team, which is just funny in and of itself, um, that, I'm also, that I'm doing both things. But my heart is in the hardware system side of the house. Um, I know four of us who stayed in. Who stayed in and didn't go total management. So the thing is, you know, the op sometimes the other opportunities come sooner and folks take them. Okay. Um, IIS, so the Intelligence Information Systems Division, has been doing a lot of hiring lately, and it's really close to 50-50. No kidding. Mm -hmm. Really close. And it's surprising. Yeah. So the other thing is, when I hired into IIS and uh, 99. I think all of my team leads up until the time I became a team lead, and then my group lead above me, were probably the first six or seven years long. And that's the funny, interesting thing, because software, regardless of the part of Raytheon you're in, there are way more women in software than and in operations and logistics in those three areas than there are in my traditional neck of the woods. Not that many mechanical, not that many electrical, which then yields to not a whole lot of systems. Um, but software, on the other hand, yeah, not just in, but leading, and not just being team lead or department lead, but we've had women way up in the, in the echelon on the software side of the house, which is a really good thing. Um, so are the opportunities there? Yes. Um, the key is you can't be passive about pursuing the opportunities. I think that's true for everybody. Well, exactly. You, yeah. Everybody has to. But it's mm -hmm. true, but stereotypically, us women will tend to not rock the boat. You know, you kind of hope that folks will see what you're doing and the great work that you're doing and will recognize you for it. It doesn't always work that way. Sometimes you have to have a little salesman in you. And stereotypically, the guys tend to do the salesman job better and more frequently. Stereotypically. And again, that's not saying that's a thing for everybody, but, but, but that's part of the piece that happens Kind of make things a little more even. I'll say one big thing about the environment we work in, uh, pretty much across the board. Everybody we work with are just amazing people yeah. across the board. Not, I mean, and technically very, very talented people. Um, do an excellent job, hardworking, but also I would say everybody has really high character. They're yeah. good people. I think some of that comes with the whole background investigation that we have to have. I mean, they go back seven years and who we know and who they know and who knows and it goes all that. But just, so the character and the quality of the people we work with is amazing. That helps every day going into work. It's so much easier when you go to work with really good people that you know and trust and who can really care about the job. Yeah, so it's cool. And then when you get to work with the same kind of people for a while, you kind of, the sports junkie that I am, you always hear folks talking about, okay, these are my brothers, I'm on the thunder. These are, these are my brothers here. 
and you know we've got each other's back. Well, the same kind of thing happen, happens for us at work. It becomes a that family-like environment, and so yeah. So there's some of us that we're, you know, you know what the kids are doing. Everybody said, hey, so I know we had a tornado come through a couple years ago, and we're checking, hey. Wow, are you all right? Because that was on your side of town. Is everything okay where you were? Yeah, we were watching it come by. You, Dodo! <laughs> <laughs> but, I yeah, mean, there's first. stuff that you know each other well. You know, we help each other out. Oh, somebody's moving. All right, hey, well, I can help you do this. And Yeah, it's, it's a cool thing. And even <coughs> on the technical side, where folks are willing to share the knowledge that they have. And that, to me, has always been great. Um, you know, even with Ken and I, you know, there's been stuff that he knows that I didn't know that he shared and vice versa. And and that's typical in our environment because it doesn't matter who knows. Because if more people know, then we've got more people who are able to do and we can get done faster. And you might have a different perspective on it and you maybe can help me solve this problem that I'm sitting here getting aggravated because I don't know the answer to yet. So, but it's, it's cool. I like it. Like that, it's been 29, and I'm still there. <laughs> so that's cool. So anything else before we run away? So is everything that Raytheon does involved in the defense industry? Predominantly, yes. So yeah. in general, we are a defense contractor. There are some other aside things. So whether it's defense or government related, so you can kind of put it in that bucket. But that's that's mostly us. We tried commercial divisions before and always failed and sold them off. Yeah, <laughs> it, it just it wasn't a thing. We, Commercials are different. Well. It's a completely different business model. Yeah. How should we get in touch with you if we want to follow up, if we want to learn more, ask further questions? I will get your dad my email address. And All right. I'll do that. Um, yeah, well, this is cool. Well, thank you for having me. Hey, you're welcome. <laughs> Glad to be here. Awesome. And cookies. Bring a cookie for the road. Yeah, exactly. And I might eat it before we get to the car. Can we get a round of applause? And I learned some Lisa stories.